part two, two of early modern English grammar. Now we're going to talk about adjectives and adverbs and verbs and who knows what else. Let's see. Um, okay. Right, so we can talk about linguistic growth and decay. We can talk about different languages or different dialects growing, that is, getting more speakers or decaying, getting fewer speakers, and sometimes they die out completely. The same is true of particular forms within a language. Um, and during this period in the Middle English, uh, sorry, early modern English, we have decaying forms and growing forms. And, and in adjectives and adverbs, uh, decaying forms including include stem changes in the comparatives. So in Old English, there's a lot of these. Long, langer, langest, strong, stranger, strangest, old, elder, eldest. Um, we These get reduced by a great number, and very few of these survive. And when they do survive, it's sometimes just as a noun made out of the adjective. So we don't talk about... It rarely we will talk about somebody being um, an elder brother. It's, it's, it has an archaic ring to it, doesn't it? But we could talk about our elders, right? So when you make a noun out of the adjective, then you might see that. Um, but otherwise, these don't often survive. Um, and we get a, um, also a decay in inflected comparatives, such as bigger, biggest. Now, when I say, when you say that, how is that decayed, Dr. Newman? Um, we still have lots of those. That's true, but that used, these used to be all our adjectives and adverbs. They used to all be, you know, beautiful, beautiful, or beautifulest is how they would have said it in Middle English. And now we have far fewer of those. Um, we What we get is a growth in what's called the periphrastic comparison and superlative. So a word like honester became more honester, more honest. And honester is a word we would see in Shakespeare, for example. Um, violenter would be, uh, most, or violentist would become most violent. And when you form the comparison and the superlative by adding more and most, that's the periphrastic. French only has this. So it may have been under the influence of French syntax that we get um, a split in the English ad adjective compared and adverb comparative system between the inflected with the comparative and com uh, superlative ending and the periphrastic where you put use the word. Um, we get a growth in the use of lee in adverbs. And by the way, this lee is actually a reduction of leek or leech in Old English, which is related to the word like. So in modern, like, informal vernacular, colloquial English, when somebody says, I did it real quick-like, or, you know, um, he did it real sneaky-like, that is colloquial, sort of, um, you know, lowbrow modern English, but it is the same formation uh, that English has been using to make adverbs since Old English times. And that, that you know, that um, free-like becomes, free, you know, free-leech, free leak the C drops off the end and then it's freely. Um, and so we get more and more adverbs like this, but we still get um, a free variation between um, adverbs using that ending and just using the adjective. I did it real quick versus I did it real quickly. Um, in early modern English, there's these are used um, uh, interchangeably. You know, he looked passing strange. He looked, uh, you know, uh, Anyway, um, it, good and well, for example, right? He did it good, he did it well. Um, these are, again, used interchangeably in early modern English. Um, because the rule books of grammar saying how, what is the correct and what is the wrong form of English haven't been written yet. Those are going to get written in the 1700s, as, as we'll see in the next unit. But there is no standard, well, there is a standard English develop developed, developing, but there's no prescribed correct English yet. So um, we see variation between different forms all through the early modern English period, and this is important to remember. A little bit more about adjectives and the comparison. Um, it's still in flux, and when I say there's no correct, you know, uh, prescribed correct form, an example of this is the fact that we have multiple or double comparatives used all the time in early modern English. Um, you can describe something as more larger or most boldest. Um, here we have from the most unkindest cut of all and his more braver daughter. 
both of these by no less an author than William Shakespeare himself. And this is called multiple or double comparative or multiple or double superlative in the case of most unkindest, right? This is the more braver is the double comparative. Um, now, here's a question for you. When it comes to modern English, present day English, is there a rule for when we use the inflected comparison for when we use the paraphrastic? Um, I think the, the rule of thumb that um, uh, people learning English as a second language follow is that monosyllables take the inflected comparison. So that is, if it's, if it's an adjective in one syllable, it's inflected, but if it's a polysyllable, it takes the paraphrastic. A good question is, does this always work? Is it, is it, does it work enough? What rules can we work out? How do you know? Why does it sound right or wrong? Just something for you to think about. Does it depend on what adjective ending we're using? Some of these adjectives come from Old English, such as full, um, or e or le, and some come from French, such as us, us or abel. Right? And these are, these are words that you make an adjective out of other parts of speech. Um, so which take the inflected and which take the comparative? Um, let's talk about verbs now, because verbs are one of the bigger and more interesting stories of the early modern period. Um, first of all, we lose the second person singular est, thou knowest, right? Um, we also see a gradual replacement of the eth third person singular form, as in, you know, the Bible, the wind bloweth where it listeth, um, and that gets replaced by the northern form s. You might remember this from Middle English when we looked at different dialects, that the wind blows where it lists, it goes instead of it goeth. That is spoken in the northern England, but it gradually takes over the southern English form. Um, we also see the adoption throughout the south, gradually, of they are rather than they be. Um, you are rather than uh, you beeth. Uh, I am, also I am rather than I be um, or I been. Um, so this, these, these northern forms of the verb to be take over the, uh, from the, the older forms um, and become the recognizable modern forms that we use in present day English. Um, although you know, art, of course, drops out as in thou art. Um, and it gets with the loss of this inflected second person verb. Um, another thing, more verbs in early modern English shift from strong verbs to weak verbs. So in Old English, we had, sorry, in, in early modern English, we frequently had forms like, instead of saying, I helped my mother, we would say, I hope my mother. Instead of, I delve, delved into a cave, I dove. Uh, you know, the cheese uh, melted? No, the cheese malt, right? And of course, this survives in a, in a derived form of the, th of the participle, molten, right? Um, seethe, to boil, right? This is what seethe originally meant. meant. It goes back to an old English, seethion, to boil. Um, and something that boiled, I sod, right? And then sodden is boiled, which is where we get the idea of sodden being wet. It's also where you get, I think, soldering iron. Um, Bide, I bide, I bided my time. I know I bade my time. Um, but here's the weird thing. Uh, sorry about the typo there. Strong. Some weak verbs become strong. So, um, <sighs> shaked, dived, growed, shined, shrinked, swinged. These were all weak verbs in the early modern English period for the most part, and they all became by analogy with other strong verbs, strong verbs. So, you know, I shook, I dove, I grew, I shone, I shrank, I swang. Um, so there's still kind of like uh, a lot changing in the verb system. There's no pattern to predict which verbs change in which direction. Each verb has its own story, but they do get fixed again in the 1700s when the grammar rules get written um, uh, this is the correct way to speak English. It kind of freezes the system um, to a certain degree. Uh, in 
places where people aren't reading those grammar books so much, we continue to get new forms of past participles forming. And of course, in Ozarks English here in southwestern Missouri, you might have heard somebody say, you know, I drug it in from outside. And that, that drug is, of course, a, a, a past form of drug that's a strong form, right? Or I bake in it, um, I wash in it. Um, these, these are forms that existed and uh, have dropped out of standard English, but still survive here and there in non-standard English. Now, um, I heard, I've heard somebody talk about uh, how they dislike the use of the word text as the past is like, I texted him yesterday. But this is actually a new iteration of something that we saw in early modern English called the zero form past. And it's something we see when there's a dental a duh or a tuh sound at the end of the word, which our, maybe our brain registers as being past. I hoist it. I knit it. These are the past tense in early modern, but now we have hoisted and knitted, uh, have replaced those. Um, so each verb has its own story and it's sort of interesting. Uh, another thing that changes is how verbs get used in sentences, and this is more complicated. Um, first of all, we see uh, the emergence on a much wider standard scale of the auxiliary do in negation and questions. So we don't say, you know, had you lunch. We say, did you have lunch, right? We don't say, I had lunch not, as we, as, and this is, we say, I did not have lunch. And the, the forms that we don't use, those old fashioned forms, those are the way negatives are still formed in most Germanic languages you know, German, Swedish, Dutch, uh, so on and so forth. But we use this weird auxiliary. John McWhorter argues that this is the influence of, um, of uh, Welsh, of, of Celtic grammar on our language. Um, it's an interesting uh, idea. But I, I don't know, I'm not enough of an expert on that topic to say. All I know is that this becomes the standard form in the early modern English, and it replaces the older simple negations and que uh, questions. Um, we get a shift of modal verbs, and this is complicated. Um, Reed and Van Gelderen, she gives a better explanation of this. Uh, um, from lexical to attitudinal, and one of the main examples of this is will. You know, um, which in Old English, willan is, it's related to the word will, and it means I want. So if I say, you know, I will uh, go to the store, it means I want to go to the store. And we get a gradual shift from that to mean to be an auxiliary referring to the future tense. And it's at a transitional stage in early modern English. Um, for um, another example is I may. Which means um, I have the I am allowed to I can if I want to. It also means it comes from an, um, Middle English or Old English magon to be able to I can, um, but, but it becomes to be used in this kind of deliberative way. I'm thinking about it. This is what we mean by attitudinal. Um, there are a lot of examples of this. Um, I, I'm not going to go deeply into them, but um, read in Van Gilderen and also in. Um, Seth Lear's chapter on Shakespeare, if you want to take a much deeper dive into the changing ways that modal auxiliaries are used in uh, early modern English and how Shakespeare exploits the ambiguity between these changing meanings, um, go to the PowerPoint and follow the slick to, a link to find a lecture that Professor Lynn Magnuson of my alma mater, University of Toronto, gave at the Folger um, Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. We see an increased use of complementary infinitives, um, and this goes along with the decay of the subjunctive. So whereas in, in, mid, in Middle English you would see more a uh, use of the subjunctive verbs where you'd say, where you'd say, I hope I go, and go would be like in a subjunctive uh, mood, we say, I hope to go, right? Complementary infinitive is when you have an infinitive, you know, to think, to sleep, to work, used as the predicate of a verb. I prefer to, I like to, I, I want to, I hope to, I, I fear to, all of these, um, whatever verb follows, I fear, I fear to sleep, I go, I hope to sleep, I want to sleep, I, I, and so on. These, this is the complementary infinitive, that is, it's the subject complement. Um, another weird thing in, in early modern English that has mostly passed out of standard English is the present passive progressive. Um, and in early modern English, we might see the ship was building 
Um, and this gets replaced um, by the ship was being built, which is, you know, more sort of logically, notionally correct, and it becomes the prescribed form by the grammarians of the 18th century, but it was often, there was a, this present active progressive, the ship was building, was used in a passive sense in early modern English. Um, we still, again, if, if, you, if you ever said the file's printing, you really mean the file is being printed, right? So, so we, this still exists, and I, I think a good, uh, a good Elizabethan, uh, Elizabethanism in Midwestern Ozarks English, you also hear this in the Alleghenies in Ohio and Western Pennsylvania, the floor needs mopping, the car needs washing. You ever hear that? That's a good, that's a good Elizabethanism. That's a good early modern English phrase that still survives. Um, that was far more common in the early modern English period. Um, later on, when we're talking about dialectical, uh, di regional dialects, we'll talk about a lot about how these, what are called archaicisms, older forms survive in non-standard varieties of modern English. Um, there's a lot of information I've given you in these two grammar lectures. Um, but remember, you can put on the, um, the uh, captions, which sometimes help, sometimes don't, with Middle English, as you may have learned already. Um, and you can also slow down the speed if you're not catching everything. Um, or speed it up if you're like, okay, get to it already, come on. Um, the, 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 you just click on that little cog thing. If you're, that's one of the reasons I like to use YouTube, because it has that feature as well as the captions. Anyway, if you have any questions, get into the forums. Um, contact me on Slack. Do what you need to do. Um, I hope you're enjoying this. I hope that you're relieved to get to um, uh, a part of English that is far more recognizably our own language. And um, yeah, keep, keep working hard. Bye.